having me here. It's really Great. fun. So much. And um, my name, as you know, is Joanna Wysek, and uh, I've been involved in product development of antimicrobials, antibiotics. I work as a study lead at um, former Covans, now LabCorp Drug Development, and very happy to share my experiences and talk to you about what I know uh, and make it uh, an interesting discussion. So today um, it's really about providing you with an overview of development of antimicrobials. Um, as we are just kicking off this series focused on um, the development R&D aspects of antibiotics, antimicrobials, antibiotics, this uh, antibacterials. This will be a high level overview of everything or more, more or less everything that is happening in the field um, and all the stages that are required. So we'll go through some beginnings just to really know where it all started um, through antibiotics throughout the history. So some timelines will talk about resistance, overview about the R&D process and challenges in the field. And um, so moving on, if you just give me a second, yeah. Uh, so back to the basics in terms of really understanding where it all started. And the beginnings were uh, quite a while ago. Uh, so it started with Alexander Fleming back in, 2000, uh, back in 1928. Uh, who really by accident uh, really developed uh, and did all the research around penicillin, which was the first antibiotic discovered by him. Uh, and actually, as you can see on this picture, uh, that's pretty much how it happened. He was just about to go on holiday, left his Petri dishes on a bench. Um, bacteria that were growing on this, on this Petri dish uh, didn't fully managed to grow on the whole plate because um, as he left them uh, on the bench, he, he got some contamination and some molds. And that's how this mold developed some compound that really prevented bacteria from growing around it. So you can see this clear zone on a Petri dish where bacteria weren't growing. So he came back from his holiday and I was a bit surprised. And, and that's how the first antibiotic happened. And, you know, I'm a bi microbiologist by background, so I really wish that similar thing happened to me. And I quite often left Petri dishes on the bench around, but I've never actually accidentally discovered a new antibiotic. So that was really, uh, really nice and lucky, uh, but really great for us because it was the first thing uh, first antibiotic ever and it obviously was from a fungus and um, so so now you can actually see that that fungus and bacteria can produce antibiotics to actually fight each other so it's very interesting uh, but importantly all this great research was done by Fleming but he's a scientist and he didn't quite know how to really best extract that uh, substance, so penicillin, to really produce enough of it to treat patients. And that's where a bigger group of people steps in. So in 1938, so as you can see, 10 years later, which is quite shocking in a way, we've got Howard Flory, <clears throat> Ernst Ch Chain, and many others actually from University of Oxford, then really focus on the production of penicillin. So here we're talking really large batches to be able to produce enough to actually treat people. Because Fleming, as much as he wanted to do it, he couldn't quite extract enough of penicillin to, to treat patients. And this amount of uh, research and teamwork actually led to a proper manufacturing process, which was actually done in collaboration with Pfizer and they used um, from um, large batches fermentation tanks to really develop enough of the fungus and enough of the uh, penicillin that is produced by the fungus to really uh, treat patients. And that was actually quite fitting at the time because it was around the First and Second World War. Um, and uh, it really helped to treat patients. Um, and also importantly, as you all know, and now we don't really think too much about infectious diseases, but at that time in 30s, 40s, infectious diseases were the main 
um, the main, really, the main problem. No one was really thinking too much about Alzheimer's. No one was really worried about ca cardiovascular diseases. Everyone was really worried about infectious diseases. They were the things that were killing people. So that was a huge medicinal breakthrough, uh, something that really allowed people to control infectious diseases uh, and a, a huge stepping stone in the medicine itself. And as I said, the production of penicillin wasn't particularly easy because they were using fermentation tanks and, and that means growing um, fungi in huge batches and really uh, extracting that which um, leads to many stages to get to the pure penicillin. But in 1950s, we, we managed to get um, a fully synthetic version, which is easier to produce. So also an interesting milestone, important milestone. And something that I really wanted to highlight to all of you is, I feel like people quite often forget about that, is that actually antibiotics, um, are important and are predominantly de derived actually really from our environment. So the fact that bacteria in the soil and bacteria wherever they are, they are competing with each other. Um, and as we do humans in society fight with each other, they fight with each other as well, developing all those different antimicrobials, antibiotics. And it's a very much an evolution process through which they are going. Um, and by observing the nature and by really focusing on how bacteria uh, are coexisting with each other, we manage actually to, to develop all those antibiotics. So as you can see in the table, you can actually notice that streptomycin was derived from a microorganism called streptomyces griseus. And predominant amount of bacteria actually comes from the nature. Actually, uh, the majority of them comes from the soil organisms. And, and we'll get to that point in a second. Um, but it, it's really fascinating that the things we are using to, to prevent infectious diseases are actually coming from bacteria and fungi itself. So those deadly microorganisms that we are so afraid of. And just importantly to mention that only later um, we just shift our focus to semi-synthetic and synthetic ways of improving those antibiotics. But majority of scaffolds and majority of the chemical structures we, we work with are actually uh, naturally derived antibiotics. Um, and this is really a bit of an overview and here I just really want to highlight that between really 1940s and 1960s, the majority of the antibiotic were developed. Um, that was so-called the golden era for antibiotics. And here you can see a slightly um, more uh, detailed version of that timeline, also highlighting the discovery void um, between 80s and, and currently. Uh, and also what's important to notice here is that we haven't really seen many new classes of antibiotic being antibiotics being developed since 1987. So there is a bit of a void and a bit of a problem around innovations, um, which we'll touch on towards the end of this presentation, just to bring you, bring you more of a 360 overview of what's currently happening in the field. But as you can see, currently used antibiotics, the antibiotics that we use all the time actually have been developed ages ago, quite a while back, which is fascinating in itself. And on this graph, you can also see, and I, that's something I particularly wanted to discuss with, with you guys, is that resistance, in, resistance to antibiotics is something that was identified really early on. So when Fleming, Alexander Fleming, um, discovered penicillin in 1928, soon after that, he also realized that antibiotic, uh, the resistance to penicillin actually exists. So as you see on the timeline on the right, penicillin was fully used and, and quite popular, popular amongst patients in 1943. 
And back in 1940, we already knew that Staphylococcus is resistant to penicillin. Same about other um, antibiotics. So if you look at vancomycin that was um, uh, developed in 1972, pretty much 10 plus years later, we see resistance to vancomycin. Some antibiotics actually acquired resistance much earlier. It's very much dependent um, how often the antibiotic was used for which indications was the main target. But for example, um, methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus was identified only two years after methicillin was introduced. So two years seems like nothing, especially that it actually takes 10 years to develop an antibiotic. So you take all this time, a decade, to develop an antibiotic, and then two years later, you already see resistance, which can be actually quite um, upsetting and distressing in a way, because you want those antibiotics to be treatments for long term, and you want to ensure that they save people's life. So it's a constant, constant battle, and I really want to, and I feel like we don't really talk about it too often, um, antibiotics are not uh, produced there to, to, to work forever. Uh, it's an evolution, as I said. Bacteria and fungi produce compounds to really fight with each other in those quite challenging environments. And bacteria are very used to developing mechanisms to protect themselves from those um, compounds such as antibiotics. And that's why it, it's a constant effort to, to develop new antibiotics, to improve existing antibiotics that will only allow us to maintain um, existing antibiotics and also be able to keep infectious diseases in check. But moving on to the next slide. This is to highlight how prevalent um, resistance, resistance can be. So here we have, you can see a chart of Staphylococcus aureus and resistance to methicillin, which I mentioned earlier. And you can, when you look at the picture, you probably can see how variable it is. So there are a couple of countries uh, where prevalence of resistance is quite low in that particular bacterium is below 1%, and, and these are Scandinavian countries. And a couple of countries where um, the overuse of antibiotics or misuse of antibiotics led to quite high resistance. So as you can see in Romania, it's about 50%, which is quite high. And importantly to mention is that bacteria don't really know the borders, so that resistance will spread across different countries over time. Um, and as you probably know, bacteria have many mechanisms to actually share those antibiotic resistant variants. So if you see um, antibiotic resistance in Staphylococcus aureus, a couple of years later, you might see it in, in Streptomyces, in different species. So, so that spreads, that mechanism spreads, it's a de defense mechanism for bacteria, so they really know how to evolutionarily cope with, uh, with that. Uh, but I also want to share a couple of stats with you, uh, which really highlights, highlight the overuse or misuse of antibiotics. So in acute care hospitals in EU, a mean prevalence of patients receiving, receiving at least one antibiotic uh, on any given day is roughly 30%. So one in three patients will actually get an antibiotic, which is quite high. Um, also, 60% um, of antibiotics sold in the US goes directly um, uh, to farming. So these are the antibiotics used in humans and they're used in farm industry, which also uh, is, is, is beyond ideal. This shows, I think this is really interesting actually. So this focus in general on AMR resistance across the globe. And I don't know what your first thought is, but you, you can see a lot of white spaces there and that's basically 
where AMR, antimicrobial resistance, is not reported or is not reliable to report. And as you can see, um, we actually don't know what's going on in quite a lot of countries. And even in the countries that we have some shades of blue, so we think we know, very often it's, um, it's not the best reporting we can have. So we definitely know that resistance is raising and we definitely know that it's spreading but there's still a lot of scope to focus on quite efficient um, well a uniform surveillance of antimicrobial resistance. And just to highlight that antibiotic um, resistance is actually one of the biggest public health challenges of our time, and it leads to death. So each year in the US, at least 2.8 million people get antibiotic resistant infections, and more than 35 million people die. Um, so on that note, I think it's, it's good timing to move to um, the antibiotic development. So here, um, we'll not have deep dives into each of the stages, we'll have an overview of each stage. And um, from my conversations with the organisers, you'll have later on um, webinars that have really detailed, in-depth um, discussions about each of those stages. There's so much information here um, that you definitely will need a separate webinar for each of these um, sections. But first of all, I really want you to, to, to know what are the main stages. So first of all, you have to do basic science and discovery. And those things, or this stage, is usually happening in academia at the moment and small, medium-sized enterprises. And a bit of a historical aspect here. Um, in the past, during the golden era, such things were predominantly happening. Um, so basic research and discovery was happening predominantly at pharmaceutical companies. And there were quite a few engaged in discovery of antibiotic research. It was a very prolific period. Um, but nowadays, um, there's also um, an economic problem with antibiotics, which we'll get to, and hence uh, most of the pharmaceutical companies actually left the field and innovations and discovery is done at universities and uh, mostly through small startups. But that stage really includes a couple of things. So really uh, in the past, we did a lot of antibiotic discovery platform screenings which were very efficient, and that's predominantly throughout the golden era. Um, and at the moment, uh, the approach is quite mixed. So again, screening a semi-synthetic approach to improvement of antibiotics, synthetic approach, also target-based approach. So there's a mixture of everything. And in terms of um, what we do and what we target, there's a certain amount of targets um, we know that work. So as you know, bacteria can be divided into gram negative and gram positive, and gram negative are slightly different and slightly more difficult to, uh, to attack because they have quite a thick membrane, which uh, prevents them from being penetrated by antibiotics. Um, and hence, we've got sometimes a very limited amount of targets. And these include cell walls. So you can see a picture there that helps us illustrate those things. So cell wall um, antibiotics also target DNA, RNA synthesis, um, also cell membrane. And uh, you can see a couple of really nice examples. So deptomycin, which was introduced um, in 2007, I think from my memory, so, so the one of the newest, is actually targeting cell membrane. Then you have beta-lactams that are targeting cell wall and also protein synthesis. Um, and there's quite a lot, a few, so tetracyclines, microlides, etc. And at the same time, so going back to our topic, because uh, you can't really distinguish between the two, with all those targets uh, also come mechanisms of resistance, so even antibiotic is, um, needs to enter the cell to, um, 
to stop the synthesis of specific proteins, which are really crucial uh, for the development of bacteria. Um, you've got efflux pumps that prevent it from entering and pump it out. Um, so bacteria can also mod modify the cell wall or the cell membrane to prevent those antibiotics from entering, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you can actually see on the picture which antibiotics uh, work which way and um, what resistant mechanisms work uh, against them. Um, importantly to mention here is that despite great efforts and throughout the decades, we still have very specific targets um, and we, we struggle to find new targets and go beyond the, the ones that we have. So ribosomes, cell wall, uh, DNA gyrase and topoisome neurases, et cetera. Dr. Lin said this. Um... Hi. Okay. I think um, so. Now, um, a bit more detail about antibiotic uh, development in terms of screening platforms and um, how it started. So, it starts really with uh, Mr. Waxman. And he's predominantly the person that contributed to the golden era of antibiotics, the greatest. Uh, he developed a method, uh, a, a very efficient screening methods, method, um, an overlay method that used soil samples. And you can see on the right how it works. So you've got a prepared soil sample with a metal coil and agar inside. You grow bacteria on the agar, bacteria of interest, and you have a membrane underneath and on top to prevent any contamination from the air. And as the bacteria of interest grow, um, then you see whether the bacteria present in soil actually develop any antibiotics, antimicrobials that kill the bacteria in the agar, so inside that ring. And that was really an efficient way of screening because first of all, it's really cheap. Second of all, it's really easy. And most importantly, you can screen a lot of samples at the same time. And as I said, um, antibiotics are produced by bacteria and fungi as, a, as an evolutional weaponry. So they use it to kill each other um, and, and fight for space and food. Uh, so the, me the more space they can actually gain through developing effective antibiotics, the more um, space to reproduce and eat they have. So that was a very efficient way of using soil to really find out um, or discover those antimicrobial, antibacterial um, compounds uh, that bacteria are producing. And um, as you can see, it's actually mentioned on the slide, um, this method, which was extremely successful, uh, even though so simple, actually produced a lot of novel antimicrobials, actinomycin, streptomycin, um, streptothricin, etc. cetera. Um, and I, I believe, uh, at least in my personal opinion, it was the most efficient platform so far. And majority of scaffolds we have currently actually were discovered um, discovered by using this screening method. So this is the person, uh, Mr. Selman Waxman, who was a Russian-born American uh, scientist. So he moved from Russia, from Russia to the US. Um, he was a microbiologist by, by training and very passionate about the field. What's quite interesting about what he has done is that the, the genius method that he developed actually screened over 10,000 strains. Um, and thanks to his efforts, we actually have a lot of antibiotics that were successful. He also received a Nobel Prize in 1952 for the discovery of streptomycin um, from soil, which uh, obviously uh, that's what he focused on. But also a very interesting fact here, before Mr. Uh, Waxman, we couldn't quite patent natural compounds 
um, or natural products in the US. And that was his effort together with Merck, so one of the biggest pharmaceutical companies, to really um, convince FDA that once you identify an antibiotic and you purify it and you prepare it for potential drug use, it's distinct enough and different enough to patent it. And, and that created a whole new business and incentivized or whole new market and incentivized pharmaceutical company to join the field and start pursuing de the development of antibiotics and um, really screening, so using his method and screening for new compounds. I also want to mention briefly, um, but this is uh, by far not my area of expertise, um, other ways that really helped us to develop or improve on existing antibiotics. Um, semi-synthesis of antibiotics was really a response, a great response to um, antimicrobial that was developing or is developing as a, as a normal evolutionary result of producing antibiotics. And, uh, you know, when we started in uh, 40s and 50s, obviously chemistry existed back then, but we really, with improvements in chemistry, medicinal chemistry, we really learned how to take penicillin and shift or change the backbone of that compound add additional groups to make the properties of that antibiotic much better, whether in terms of penetration of cells, uh, in terms of uh, toxicity to human, or just potency, it really works. And the same for synthetic antibiotics. Um, it really, um, this really helps to not only produce antibiotics more efficiently, but also develop new classes looking at the current backbones and, and current scaffolds. And here to really show you, because I, I find it quite fascinating how those two approaches, so semi-synthetic and synthetic approaches, led to new antibiotics. So if you look at the table, you can see classes, antibiotics, and then uh, new antibiotics derived by using semi-synthetic and synthetic approaches. So penicillin, for example, is a great example because we started with penicillin in 1928. Uh, it was fully available in 1940s. And then we managed to develop an array of uh, new antibiotics based on that. So ampicillin, amoxicillin, really managed to improve the properties of this antibiotic and keep fighting fighting any potential emerging resistance as well at the same time. So on the left of this slide, you can also see um, cephalosporin. Um, so um, how this antibiotic evolved throughout the years based on semi-synthetic methods of improvement. So when you look at the first generation of cephalosporin, you can see that it was potent against gram-negative potent against gram-positive bacteria and had some sort of mediocre activity against gram-negative. And when we then look at generation number two, so looking at improvements uh, with the chemistry, medicinal chemistry, the scientists really managed to expand, expand the spectrum of activity. Uh, they also managed to improve cell penetration so suddenly this antibiotic was more efficient at penetrating the bacteria and, and destroying it from the inside. Uh, it also improved, um, um, uh, improved the activity against gram-negative bacteria. So, so those chemistry approaches really help to improve the, the overall properties of an antibiotic. Um, and as you can see, moving through generations, uh, even the fourth generation had even wider spectrum of activity, uh, higher activity against gram positive and against gram negative. <clears throat> so we can really work on a scaffold that we started with and change it throughout time to make it better for patient use and also prevent uh, resistance as we go along. Uh, we also have target-based drug discovery. So from around 1970s and 
2000. This was uh, very much a new approach to screening for new um, antibiotics. That was predominantly because if you remember, we uh, on the timelines, there was this void discovery void from 70s, where we quite exhausted the screening platforms and it was difficult to find new antibiotics. And with the advent of um, sequencing and, and uh, molecular biology, um, this was a way for looking for new targets. So with the availability of those tools, people focused or scientists focused on high throughput screening methods and really looking at finding new compounds and new antibiotics per se through this. So an example here is GlaxoSmithKline ran around 70 campaigns between just 1995 and 2001 and AstraZeneca ran 60, 65. Um, were, which were quite successful uh, for antivirals and some, um, some infectious or non-infectious diseases, but not a single antibiotic was actually found through that. Um, and in general, that platform or that way of screening at that time didn't really um, predict to be, or didn't happen to be as prolific as everyone hoped. Um, I think there were a couple of problems associated with it, and, and you have it listed on the slide. So basically, it works through identifying specific proteins that are essential for bacteria, uh, or essential uh, mechanisms, and, and then screening that against um, a database of potential drugs that could attack those targets. But bacteria, as you know, have a cell wall, a membrane wall, and uh, it's not only about about finding the right match between the target and the compound. It's also how can you get that compound through all those layers of the bacteria? And no one at the time really focused on that. Also at the time we had a very limited understanding what the right um, chemistry of a compound should be in terms of being an antibiotic. So we had this rule of Lipinski um, which really thought that antibiotics predominantly should be a small molecule of uh, low weight, etc. And, and when people were screening the databases, they were focusing on the Lipinski rule of five, which actually um, didn't, didn't really depict uh, the properties of an ideal antibiotic at all. So uh, the approach that people are currently taking and bear in mind, there's not that much innovation and not that many companies actually doing antibiotic development, but the ones that are doing it um, take more of a holistic approach at the moment. So as you know, throughout history, um, with the knowledge we gain and with technology, technological advancements, people adjust and improve their processes. So people, again, are moving to more holistic approaches of screening when they look at cell screening approaches. So incorporating all potential genetic targets, but screening the cell against a database of potential um, molecules and compounds. So that actually leads us now to the next stage. So once you've done screening uh, and basic discovery, and you, you actually found a potential compound, you found something that you think might work, um, then you go through the pre-clinical stage. So this is everything you do in the lab before you actually start doing clinical trials. And this stage is, it can be quite long. It's roughly five plus years. So it's an extensive period of time when you really focus on understanding the compound, but also improving the properties of the compound. So there's a mixture of things you're trying to achieve. So first of all, let's imagine that we have a compound of interest and let's say it's a powder. So first of all, what you really want to understand is if it works, and if it's a potential hit. So under the preclinical research, you have a couple of stages as well. So you first want to identify a hit, um, so a compound that is a potential. Then you want to go from hit to hit to lead. 
So you want to, amongst many compounds you are considering, find that one that has the highest potential of success and it's called a lead. And then you do all this research to gather enough information, safety information, toxicology information, um, to submit a dossier to a regulatory body. So whether it's FDA or EMEA or any um, a local um, uh, country specific uh, regulatory bodies uh, for a review. And that allows you to go to the next stage. But before we get there, when you have that compound, that powder, first of all, you really need to correct characterize it to so really understand the properties in terms of potency, efficiency, uh, efficacy, toxicology, um, etc. So on this picture here, you see all the sets and stages you have to go through. So we, we start with a very straightforward assay called minimum inhibitory concentration. So once you have your powder, your substance that is antibacterial, you do different concentrations of that compound and you expose it to different bacterial strains to test the potency. So how effective it is at killing or preventing bacteria from growing. Then the next stage is also you do a lot of cytotoxicity. So you try to understand how toxic it would be to humans. Um, once, once you have enough information, you can expand your MIC panel by focusing on real life isolates. So taking isolates from clinics, which have high resistance to antibiotics and see how your compound, which is a potential hit, or at this stage, it might be already a lead, how this compound is actually behaving when you expose it to real life situation and real uh, clinical isolates with potential high uh, antimicrobial resistance. And then you focus on um, absorption and all the additional things that will um, give you a bit more information on how it could behave in, in humans. So all the protein binding, plasma stability, etc. And at the later stage, um, you focus also on in vivo um, animal models. So you dose an animal with your antibiotic, but that's, that is the stage when you already have a lead compound. You already know that amongst all the derivatives and all the compounds you look at, you have that one or those two that are the most, um, uh, the most likely to succeed and have the, be the best properties in terms of potency and toxicity and you enter in vivo testing in animals to really understand how the compound behaves in an animal that is close to humans, uh, but is not yet a human. So it's relatively safe to do. You also do things uh, like resistance frequency to understand a bit uh, what to expect, but obviously those things are um, inform you about the real life situation, but even if you do them and think that resistance might not occur very quickly, you might be later surprised because um, using an antibiotic in a clinic is very different from um, using it or testing it in the lab. So the first green assays on this graph really help you also to narrow down which compound you should um, go with in terms of it being a lead and it helps you um, screen for those properties but also improve those properties. Um, medicinal chemistry is very important here as well because with the help of chemists you can really improve the formulation of your drug to, to be able to dissolve it better and um, have higher doses. Um, also depending on solubility and what's the carrier. Uh, that is also quite important in terms of toxic, toxicity uh, to humans and toxicity to animals as well. So there's, there's a lot of input from chemists as well that can actually improve the properties of the drug um, by changing the structure, adding functional groups, 
but that's that's something that happens um, when you, you when you get into the lead stage. It's also very important to mention that this stage involves a lot of people from very varied backgrounds. So in terms of MIC assays, um, this is predominantly something that microbiologists would do. So the first, the, the green one, the first one, and also expanded panels, this is all what microbiologists would do. Cyto cytotoxicity, that's what molecular biologists would do. Then you have an aspect of um, chemistry, so chemists, medicinal chemists, uh, people who have expertise in PKPD. So there's really a big team of people that have to contribute at this stage. And that's all that happens before you even can consider a clinical research. Um, so I, I, by my expertise, I'm a microbiologist, so I can just give you a, a brief deeper dive into what actually does it mean to do a minimum inhibitory concentration because someone who has never done it or who has never seen it might not really understand how it helps in terms of the development of antibacterials. So first of all, minimum inhibitory concentration is the lowest concentration of an antibiotic that inhibits the growth of bacteria. Um, and there are many different methods of doing things. And obviously, as a scientist, you always decide to go with the method that is best suited for your current stages of development and for your specific antibiotics, um, et cetera. So I wanted to just show you two uh, that help to achieve similar goal, but are very different to each other. So on the left side, you see an agar diffusion uh, method. So you have a Petri dish, the same one that Alexander Fleming was using. You inoculate it with bacteria. So bacteria are growing on the surface. And you also put discs. So it's nitrocellulose. So very similar disc to just a paper disc, but it's impregnated with an antibiotic. And you can use many discs with many different antibiotics to test how this specific antibiotic is behaving with a bacterium of interest, which you have on the plate. So as you see here, you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven discs. Each one is with a different antibiotic. And when you see that there's no zone around it, so there's no translucent around it, it means that this particular bacteria is resistant to this antibiotic because the, bio, the antibiotic is dissolving into the agar, but the bacteria can grow despite of that. So clearly there's a lot of resistance, but when you see a very nice halo, like for uh, number 14, that means that the amount of antibiotic that dissolved, dissolved into the agar and the concentration it's at in the, the zone, is high enough to prevent those antibiotics, those bacteria from growing. So that's how you can see. And this method is semi-quantitative, which means that you can still measure the zone. You can take a ruler or something, you can measure the zone. And the bigger the zone, the better, the more sensitive that bacterium is to a specific antibiotic. And the second method, the one on the right is, uh, is a quantitative method where you have 96 well plate. You use all the rows, as you can see across. You have a strain one and strain two, so two different bacteria. You obviously can have more than two. You can have just one. It's your decision. It's also your decision which bacteria you're testing your potential antibiotic on. So depending on the indication you are targeting, so the disease you're targeting, you'll be using different strains. But here, what you do, you start with different concentrations of antibiotics. So you start with a very high concentration and you go lower. So this is your quantification. You start high and then you, at in regular intervals, you lower the concentration of your antibiotic. And you also put bacteria of interest in those wells. So if antibiotic is killing 
of preventing from growing, then you have a translucent well. There's no bacteria. It's all a translucent uh, liquid, as you can see on the right. And as the concentration of the antibiotic is going lower, it allows bacteria to proliferate and grow. And that's how you start seeing this heavy orange color on the left. So this is a quantitative way because you know exactly what's the concentration of antibiotic, exactly the, the, the amount of micrograms per microliter when this antibiotic stops working. In the agar diffusion method, you don't know exactly what is the concentration. You can, you can check it, but it's not the most reliable way of checking it. And here, it's a quantitative method of doing a very similar thing. Um, but we should also move to the next stage because um, I don't want to take too much of your time. So once you've done all the research, all the research in the lab, in the animal models, and it all shows that the results are positive, uh, the, the potential antibiotic is safe, it doesn't um, create huge uh, cytotoxic reactions, then you can um, move into the clinical research. And here you have a couple of different stages. So it's divided into a phase one, phase two, phase three, FDA re review, which allows your um, compound to enter the market or not, and then phase four. So as you can see from this uh, graph, um, all those phases are quite different to each other and have a different level of participation. They're starting very small from 20 to 80 or 100 patients, uh, then doubling in size or tripling in size, and then 10 times bigger than phase two. And in between you also have regular reviews from FDA. So you're not left to yourself and, and those patients also are not left at risk. It's all very controlled. It's all very uh, heavily regulated. So this is a very busy table, but I'll guide you through it. And before we'll do it, it's, um, I also want to highlight that clinical research is very different to preclinical um, stage. And there are, again, um, a very different set of people that focus on, on that research. People from clinical research wouldn't do preclinical research. Um, so there's a lot of level, there's a lot of um, specialism and a lot of um, education that is related to become that sort of specialist in the field. Um, but importantly, uh, it, it's quite a fascinating stage. So it starts with once a drug developer, so whether it's a pharmaceutical company or a startup or an academic, once they have enough information from the preclinical stage and they feel that they've created a satisfactory dossier of information for FDA, let's say, then they can submit an investigational new drug application. And in that application, they have to provide all the relevant information for the regulatory body to review the information, review everything they have um, data-wise on, on the research they've done, and assess whether this um, compound is safe to enter human trials. So what they focus on is animal study data, toxicology, so how toxic that drug is, uh, also very important uh, manufacturing information. So we didn't really talk about it and you also have to bear in mind, we're not able to talk about everything um, because it, it's a broad area of um, a broad field. But just to briefly touch on manufacturing, before you enter clinical trials, you really have to have a very clear idea how you're producing your antibiotic on a large scale you can't just produce it in the lab. Um, so obviously when you start your preclinical research, when you are very early between discovery and, and the early beginning of preclinical, 
maybe you are producing it in the lab, but those methods are not very reliable. Uh, you're not able to produce it in la large quantities. There might be some impurities um, that you're introducing accidentally, or maybe your process is not good enough. So there are intrinsic impurities, which might be leading to additional toxicity um, or, or just providing uh, reliable results. So the levels of impurities can lead to very different results each time you're running the same experiment. So um, quite early stage, you actually have to um, and, and start a relationship with the C CMO, which is a contract manufacturing organization. So basically a, a company that will produce this compound for you in a reliable way. This company will also be uh, accredited. So they will have all the ISO standards um, and all the regulated methods of producing this uh, compound, this potential antibiotic in a reliable way, so that you know that each time this compound is being manufactured by this CMO, it's always the same compound. And therefore, every time you do your test, whether it is a test in the lab or you test it in humans, it is exactly the same composition and it's not different to the previous one because that ruins all the data testing. So you also have to provide that information. You also have to provide very clear and detailed information about clinical protocols and study plans. It's not like you just go to the clinical trial and say, oh, I'll do this and that, and halfway through you'll change everything. No, it's, it, it has to be clear what you're doing. It has to make sense. You also have to bear in mind to protect patients' health. And any additional information about you as an investigator and any prior potential human research you've done. So it's quite stringent. It's a lot of information. And also what I've learned from working with um, startups or companies developing antimicrobials is that the earlier you engage in conversation with FDA, the better, because they are also an advisory to you. They can tell you how to do best things best and how to really improve your plans going forward. But going back to the clinical research, um, there might be a rare instance of having a phase zero, but in general, the setup is that you have phase one, which focuses uh, on initial safety um, assessment and also dosage. So this is the smallest trial. It's usually 20 to 80 healthy people just to really um, assess whether there are any adverse um, events when you when you dose patients with this specific drug and also you really try to establish what is the safety safety range what is the maximum dose you can give to patients so this is this is the most tricky uh trial uh, and also the most risky to patients because it's the first moment you actually move from animals to humans and phase two which is the next stage um, is focused more on exploring the, the efficacy of that specific uh, drug. So here you can see it's a bigger phase. You have 10 to 30 volunteers. Um, you already know the dosage. So you, you just try um, different variations. Um, you also have a placebo group usually. So you have um, uh, patients that are just in control. Um, and here it really focuses on exploring the potential uh, clinical side effects um, and also exploring some rarer uh, side effects because when you run phase one, it's a very small clinical trial. So as you expand in volume and have more patients, you can see a bit more, um, a bit rarer side effects that you wouldn't see in a small co 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 cohort in pa of patients. It's also very important to say that every time each phase has finished, uh, there is a review by, NDA, by FDA that allows you not to enter the next phase. Um, so there's a lot of additional stringency across and, and regulatory checks, which are good because they are 
meant to protect uh, patients. And phase three is, um, is again, it's a final confirmation of safety and, and efficacy. It's the biggest group, so it can go, uh, it, it varies in size, it depends on, on, the, on the antibiotic, on the drug, et cetera, but it, it's roughly 10 times bigger than phase one, phase two. Um, and, um, and it really focuses, as I said, on efficacy, and it, it, it's got a very uh, targeted um, conditions. Um, so it's really the final stage to really narrow down any potential side effects, if, if any, and uh, efficacy long term. If that stage is successful, then the drug is allowed to be marketed. So we, at this stage, it can enter the market successfully. And as you can see, there's a phase four and phase four is after the market approval. So once you've done successfully all those three phases, you en enter the market and that's where phase four starts. And that's basically the market monitoring. So once your drug is out and people are using it, then companies are also um, forced to do regulatory assessments of any potential side effects that might emerge once your antibiotic is used on a wider scale. Um, and any potential side effects are obviously monitored and also there's a requirement to inform FDA about them. So that was an overview of um, pretty much all the stages we got to the marketing stage. But I also wanted to give you an overview of, of any potential challenges because it's always great to hear, oh, I think I know everything, but as everywhere, it, nothing is so simple. There are sometimes challenges and especially antibiotics are, uh, or the field of developing antibiotics is a very interesting one, um, especially in terms of economics. Uh, and there are some potential problems in terms of um, developing antibiotics, which I alluded to. So um, here it's a graph that shows you, again, stages, uh, some potential challenges and how it affects the market and the field. So first of all, when we talked about research and development, we called it the R&D stages. And here it's called a value chain. And that's because when a big pharma companies is deciding which field to put the money for development, whether it will be an oncology drug or whether it will be an antibiotic or something else, they look at each stage as a value chain and how much money that stage is generating or maybe not. So the same R&D stages allude to also value chain. So starting with basic research, here I mentioned that we had a discovery void and we also don't have many pharmaceutical companies producing new antibiotics. And I'm not sure if you've heard about it, but actually um, antibiotic field is a bit of a pickle at the moment because um, not many people are interested in developing new antibiotics, purely down to lack of economic incentives. So to narrow or to boil it down to basics, um, at the moment, as, as you are probably aware, antibiotics are quite cheap. So you can buy an effective antibiotic for two to five dollars, while an oncology therapy for a patient would be very expensive, very expensive. You can't really treat um, cancer with a drug that is $2 or $5. It's completely different scale you have to spend uh, money on to really uh, treat a patient. So if, you, if it takes you 10 years to develop an antibiotic and it costs roughly 1 billion US dollars to develop one, and then you can only sell it for $2 or $5. Um, that's not great. Also, what's not great about it is that we are all aware about antimicrobial resistance. And there's more and more pressure 
to stop overusing antibiotics, which is great. But what it also means that once a new antibiotic is developed, it's put on a shelf and no one uses it or very limited amount of people are using it because um, people want to leave it for when we don't have any other antibiotics that work. So that also helps preventing pharmaceutical companies from recouping those high costs that they've spent on new R&D or discovery of antibiotics. That's why quite often when they look at the value chain and the problems alongside, they often go and decide to do something else like oncology drugs or um, drugs for Alzheimer's where there are high gains uh, because treatments are expensive. Also, when you think about oncology, not only those treatments are very expensive, but they also are taken by patients for months, uh, sometimes even years uh, on and off. With infectious diseases, if, if you caught something like a urinary tract infection, you get an antibiotic that, that is quite cheap for two to five pounds. You take it for a week, maybe for two, and that's it. You're fully cured and maybe, maybe you spend 50 quid on it and that's it. So it's, it's not a long-term um, treatment. And also what is quite interesting, cancer treatments usually give you a couple of years extra to live a bit longer while an antibiotic saves your life completely, but it's still significantly cheaper than other, other treatments available. So that really, all those things led pharmaceutical companies to leave the field. So around 2015, 14, majority of, uh, of a big pharma companies doing antibiotic discovery really left the discovery field and R&D. And only a couple, a small minority have left. And it's really not sure if they actually do any discovery. What they predominantly do is uh, they kept some departments for antibiotics development, but they mostly acquire startups to, to then do commercialization of those antibiotics later stage. So all the innovations for, or discovery and innovations for new antibiotics is really done by um, academia, so scientists in, at universities and also startups, so very small companies with um, very limited experience and limited resources. Um, and that's why um, there is this void still. We don't really have enough people doing that research. And because a lot of pharmaceutical companies left the field, a lot of people with that very important, crucial expertise have either retired or, or changed jobs. Um, once the, the companies left the field, they didn't really have many options and they often left for oncology, or, or just retired and we left we basically lost the people that can do that research as well so there's also a problem around uh, a brain drain and not enough specialists in the field quite often the startups that are developing antibiotics are actually complaining about not having enough access to experts uh, because all those experts are either old or, or left the field completely. And there's not enough new people, young people, young scientists practicing and developing the right skill sets that can be utilized by, by companies later on the line. Also, in terms of later stages, such as preclinical and clinical stages, there's not enough money usually. Um, and I have like a very small graph to illustrate that, but um, developing an antibiotic, as I said, is around 1 billion. So it's a lot of money and um, there's not a lot of money to, to tap into. So that's also a problem. Um, clinical trials for antibiotics are also expensive and potentially of higher costs than, than um, clinical trials for oncology. And just to highlight why, because it's also a very interesting topic. First of all, when you think about clinical trials, you have those different stages and you have to recruit between 100 to 3,000 people, depending on which trial or which stage it is. 
So you really need to recruit a lot of hospitals. Those hospitals have to be trained to use the appropriate protocols, uh, which first of all costs a lot of money. But the problem here is now when you recruit a patient uh, for, uh, for the oncology treatment, those patients are not going to die the next day or very unlikely so. So if you don't give them a treatment immediately, they will be around still. So you can recruit patients as you go along. But when you have a patient with sepsis, you can't wait hours, not even hours. Um, we're not talking days. You can't even work, uh, wait hours. You have to give them treatment immediately um, within, oh, basically as soon as possible. And that is, that's why it's so difficult to actually recruit people for antibiotic trials. Uh, because those patients need to be treated immediately. So we, we don't have that extra time uh, allowing us for recruitment. Um, also, some of those cases, some of those antibiotics that people are developing is, are quite specific for specific bacteria in sepsis. So then you really have to have a specific patient with advanced antimicrobial resistance, and you need to know of that. So you need to test that person, but usually there's not enough time to test it. And there's also not enough patients with such uh, rare antimicrobial resistance. So that usually leads to companies running smaller clinical trials because they are not able to, to get to the number. And so obviously you can have one big trial that is 1000 people, but if you can't get that much, you try a couple of smaller studies that can still produce enough evidence for you, but are not so, um, it's not just the one trial, it's many trials that lead to high startup costs and, uh, and again, operational costs. So not only you have to, find those hospitals again, recruit those patients again, um, but also devise a protocol, train your um, nurses and, and doctors. Um, and that is a high additional cost that is on top of uh, just running a single clinical trial versus multiple clinical trials. Um, so I think that's, that's an overview of, of some of the main problems, which obviously it, it maybe sounds quite negative, but there's a lot of organizations that are working on um, simplifying clinical trials, streamlining um, the process. Um, so one of the problems that can be quite easily fixed in clinical trials is developing networks of clinical trial networks for antibiotics. And that's already... Uh, happening where you've got a chain or network of hospitals that cooperate with each other they are trained to use the same protocols and therefore um the the restart or startup cost of running an anti um, a clinical trial is, is much less expensive for those companies so enough about negativity some positives um, to close with um, there's more and more funding for antimicrobial resistance and the development of antimicrobial therapies. And there are multiple reasons for it. First of all, everyone knows now, it's not the novel thing or very new thing for people to, to know how important it is to have new antibiotics. If we don't have new antibiotics, we are not able to even treat people with cancer because every time you have a cancer therapy, you also take antibiotics. Even simple surgeries like a hip replacement or giving a birth can be really dangerous if we don't really have fully functioning antibiotics. So there's more and more recognition, not only uh, amongst funders, but also um, more recognition coming from governments around the importance of R&D of new antibiotics or repurposing of existing uh, antibiotics or changing uh, antibiotics through semi-synthetic uh, methods, etc. So this is uh, an overview of what happens at which stage of funding. Uh, in terms of R&D, uh, it's called push incentives because it really pushes companies into going into that field. And uh, you might have heard of Carbex, which is one of the biggest funder uh, for antibiotic therapies. Um, it had a budget 
uh, it's in the process of being uh, extended because the fund Carbex was set up for five years and um, it's being currently extended for another five years. So it had a budget for 500 million uh, US dollars and it created a portfolio of 70 companies, 70 different projects. You also have um, European Investment Bank, uh, you also have Gart P, which is based in Geneva, that also supports uh, R&D of antibiotics. Uh, BADA, which is the US government, but it, it's uh, not solely for uh, the US companies, it, it's actually more inclusive. The same about Carbex. Anyone from around the world can apply for Carbex funding and develop uh, new antibiotics. But not only new antibiotics, it focuses on vaccines, alternative therapies, and these are very exciting, such as phages, microbiome, antibodies for infectious diseases, and even diagnostics. So uh, there's a specific separate round for diagnostics as well. And you also have a Novo fund, which is not listed here. So there's uh, more and more uh, funding to tap into due to the recognition of the importance of focusing on that research. So on that slightly more positive note, I would want to finish my presentation uh, and hope it was not too long. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh... Joanna for the wonderful presentation. I hope I'm audible. Uh, it's been a pleasure uh, hearing from you. Uh, we are really thankful. And maybe, <laughs> sorry, I can, someone is, okay. okay, yeah. So thank you once more. Thank you, Joanna, for the wonderful presentation. It has been, wow, well, it has been a quite a very informative and insightful presentation. We are really thankful for, you know, taking your time from your busy schedule and going, just taking us through the whole process. I've learned a lot personally. Uh, and uh, for those in the room, uh, Joanna is very modest. Uh, <laughs> she doesn't mention some of her, she has really accomplished a lot. She has worked with Welcome, she has worked with CarbaX, and she's currently working with one of the largest uh, contract research organizations. So she has quite uh, a lot of experience on, on this field and uh, we're really uh, wonderful to have her. You will be seeing her face <laughs> once again because we'll be engaging her more in developing uh, one of the fence programs that is coming up. Uh, so without further ado, I'll invite Jimmy. Jimmy, you can maybe take us through the questions in the chat box. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Daniel. Thank you, Joanna. Actually, we're so much grateful to have Joanna this time. Actually, we have had a very nice session, a very nice presentation, and we are looking ahead uh, to have you every now and then. Actually, uh, the session that you had today, uh, we have learned a lot. Actually, there's a lot that you have gained from your session today, from your training. And maybe going forward, we should learn a lot. Uh, uh, what I could urge my colleagues is that uh, this is uh, a very urgent need that to get into research, uh, find uh, opportunities maybe to mitigate this uh, threat of antimicrobial resistance. Uh, actually, it is a major problem that uh, if we allow to limit maybe in our society, actually it could be so difficult to mitigate maybe any treatment that uh, uh, that we can encounter. Uh, I can see some raising the hand. Arnold. Arnold. Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Joan, for the presentation. It has been good. I would like to ask this question from your experience and uh, working with those different companies, have you said? Mm -hmm. This uh, current situation, as we have learned from the pandemic of COVID. Is it ideal to create for companies to be running to create for more vacuum, more antibiotics, or it is better? Oh, it's better. I didn't. 
didn't hear the um okay think i think you have i know let you go on i've heard the majority of question or is it better um uh, uh, not sure what would be the end <clears throat> but uh, before we get arnold back um i can definitely say that i don't think antibiotics solely are the answer to everything yeah, we use the one which are variable and we change the way people are Uh, hello. Maybe, maybe, maybe write your question in the chat, and then um, I can. Yeah. I can if there's some uh, connectivity issue, um, just to start Joanna, on that. Yeah. I think I've, I've had uh, other question. Mm -hmm. I think he was referring to uh, maybe within the pandemic, and it also touched on what you are talking about: our antibiotics, our soul. You know. Uh, are they the, the punishment of everything? And also, he was asking, uh, would it be better to advocate more, uh, you know, for more rational use of the existing antibiotics to, you know, maybe preserve them? But I know you can continue and type in the chat box. Thank you. This is a great, not only a question, but a great point. Honestly, a great point. Really, really uh, very valid. First of all, it's very important to produce antibiotics. I, I definitely, I am a strong advocate for that, but we also um, have to be quite mindful about awareness and stewardship and also diagnostics. Um, also bear in mind that we have alternative therapies as well, which maybe are at the beginning of um, transpire transpiring into useful therapies. So we are just starting with microbiome. We're just starting with phages. Um, but those therapies should not be seen as secondary or worse. They should be complementary to antibiotic use. So going back to the topic or the question slash uh, the statement, I totally agree that we really have to focus on awareness and make people aware um, first of all, about the importance of antibiotics, but then about how we should be actually working with antibiotics. Misuse is really bad. At the moment, we are taking a lot of antibiotics for things that are not, um, they are not needed. Um, and that really leads to sublethal doses of antibiotics used and creating more antimicrobial resistance. Um, we also overuse antibiotics. Um, not only in humans, but also in animals. We use antibiotics as a growth factor. So we pump them into chickens and, and farming animals to, to allow them to grow quicker and faster and bigger. Uh, and that leads to antimicrobial resistance as well. And those bacteria that develop antimicrobial resistance in animal, then they get into soil, our waters, and they spread across the globe. So as, as I mentioned, th these antibiotic resistance genes from one bacteria can actually migrate to a different bacteria. So we kind of think, oh, it, it's not a problem because that particular bacteria that uh, developed resistance in, in a chicken will just die. Not necessarily, it, it might actually get into a soil, proliferate, spread, someone will get an accidental infection and more importantly, that bacteria can also spread those resistant genes with other bacteria, different species, which creates a lot of problem um, because that's how we keep seeing more resistance spreading over time. But awareness and education is very important and I think there's not enough of it. Um, people still don't really understand how antibiotics should be taken, uh, whether people should be finishing the courses of antibiotics, um, this presentation was predominantly about the development uh, of new antibiotics and, and potential challenges to the field, but uh, that's true. Um, awareness is one of the important issues, awareness about how to use antibiotics and awareness about the problems long term. Even during COVID, there was a huge overuse of antibiotics as a secondary line. Um, sometimes they were used because people were developing pneumonia, but very often they were also used as preventative 
so that the patient doesn't develop pneumonia, which is a problem in itself because um, there's a lot of literature available right now that the misuse and overuse of antibiotics increased uh, in the past two years during the pandemic. And also no one is using diagnostics. So we, um, so we don't really know which bacteria we are trying to, to fight when someone develops an infection. And, um, and we don't really know whether it should be a narrow spectrum antibiotic or broad spectrum of antibiotic, because if you don't know which bacteria you're fighting, you don't know which antibiotic to give. So people usually give a broad spectrum antibiotics that destroys everything, maybe not necessarily the specific pathogen that is responsible for the disease. And, and, and that, has, that is also a problem in itself. There's also an economic problem because as I just briefly mentioned, diagnostics uh, for infectious diseases are way more expensive than an actual uh, antibiotic. And in countries where public healthcare is not, uh, uh, where healthcare is not public and you pay out of your own pocket and you have to pay so much more just to know which antibiotic to use, it's really difficult for people to justify that. If you have to pay 15 pounds, 15 dollars, um, to get a diagnostic to know which bacteria it is, and then five pound, five dollars or pounds on top of that, suddenly your treatment is twenty dollars instead of five. So it makes a huge difference to people. Um, so I think, um, as many people call it, a broken market for antibiotics. It definitely is a broken market for antibiotics. Um, and as um, the governments and pharmaceutical companies and NGOs and charities are trying to solve this problem, we are still relatively behind uh, solving it in a sustainable manner. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Joanna, for a very elaborate explanation about the answer that I've just asked. Thank you so much for that. Uh, we have another question from uh, Mugeji Nathan asking, uh, thanks for the presentation, Madam. Could you elucidate why that generation cephalosporins are regarded as large spectrum antibiotics? Sure. Um, if I understand the question, um, Maybe it leads to my um, slide about semi-synthetic and synthetic methods. I think that's where I introduced it. Um, when we develop antibiotics, and bear in mind, I'm not a medicinal chemist, um, I'm a microbiologist. Um, you look at the scaffold you have and what the properties of that specific antibiotic are. And uh, you, you, over time, try to change it using chemistry, adding functional groups to increase various aspects of that antibiotic. Uh, quite often, people focus on potency. Uh, they focus um, on gram-negative, on gram-positive bacteria, depending on uh, which, um, what is the starting point? And you also try to explore and expand that diversity and potency. So if you have an antibiotic that is acting quite well on gram positives, you obviously ideally would want to uh, expand it to gram negatives, which are much more difficult to, to treat actually due to the complexity of the membrane and physiology they have. Um, sometimes it's possible. Uh, there's a very famous um, professor, um, uh, Andrew Mayer, based in Boston, who actually focused on macrolides and enabled uh, through chemical modification to expand, expand the spectrum of, of antibiotics to really be much wider and be for those antibiotics to be more potent. Um, and that is actually a very important aspect, uh, aspect of um, drug development. You rarely start with a compound that is ideal from a start. You, you, when you screen it, you see some properties that are relatively promising. And then, and then you try to improve that compound. You, you screen it against various different strains to see which direction, which, which bacteria it can work on. And then you improve those scaffolds and, and those compounds through medicinal chemistry and formulation work as well. Sometimes those antibiotics uh, 
compounds are not very soluble. So you can also change that by changing the moiety and making sure uh, that you can, um, it's, it's better absorbed by humans. So I can give you an example. I worked with um, one company and, and they had a lead compound, which was, which was really potent. The problem was that it wasn't very soluble. So you actually had to put a lot of that compound through a human uh, vein physically when you were injecting it because it was an IV, IV, IV treatment, intravenous treatment. You had to pump quite a lot of it um, uh, to get the effect they wanted because the drug wasn't as soluble as, as ideally it could have been. And when you do that, it can have actually much worse um, adverse effects. So because of that, the drug was actually irritant to the skin and was creating a lot of um, problems to the patients throughout the, the clinical trial. Um, and that's where a medicinal chemist can also step in, where chemists step in by adjusting the formulation of that particular uh, compound. They really managed to improve solub solubility of that drug so even though it was irritant to the skin and irritant to the patient, because they managed to improve solubility, they also uh, managed to put less compound into uh, through the vein and limit that adverse reaction only because the solubility was so much better. So you really could lower the dose that you're giving to patient and lowering the adverse effects at the same time. Um, so that was. Um, and um, there's a lot of things people can do. And there's a lot of expertise that is used to modify those compounds effectively um, to make them work better for us. Oh, thank you so much. So much for the question. Then move to the next question uh, from Paul Ojuang asking, what is the future of drug discovery and development process in terms of time taken? Will it take, will it follow the route of COVID-19 vaccine or what do you think about that? Thank you. Yes, um, a very good question. Um, so uh, how, to, how to approach this question? First of all, I think COVID in a way really helped the diagnostic field. Um, we are rarely using any diagnostics for antibiotics. Um, so the concept of um, um, first screening the patient to know exactly which bacteria pathogen caused it and then adjusting the right uh, treatment through using the right antibiotic is very foreign. It rarely happens. It only happens in a very limited amount of countries, and even then it's not systematic. So the whole COVID pandemic really highlighted the problem of not having diagnostic tests. Even diagnostic tests for COVID were initially a problem, and we managed to develop lateral flow um, antibody tests. We're still developing effective tests for uh, T cells for COVID through which the immune response is mostly driven, driven by. So definitely a very clear message that we need diagnostics and people started appreciating diagnostics as a tool to help public health and health patients' outcomes. Um, also, I think through COVID, people really realized that infectious diseases, whether they are caused by viruses or bacteria, um, are very important in terms of focusing on them and giving money to those fields. Without enough money, we can't really um, fight those diseases effectively. Um, so I think definitely a positive for infectious diseases. In terms of antibiotics, it, it's, it's more mixed because there's enough evidence that COVID actually was also slightly negative because there was a lot of overuse of antibiotics during the pandemic. Um, uh, there's a lot of literature from many different countries stating that quite, uh, quite obviously. Um, I'm only hoping, and I think we're starting to see it, that there will be more funding available for infectious diseases, 
And with this pandemic being so visible and so dramatic, um, people often call antimicrobial resistance as a silent pandemic. Silent because it's not so visible. Um, patients with uh, antimicrobial resistant um, sepsis or with diseases um, resistant to antibiotics, they happen and there's more and more of those patients, but it's not as spectac spectacular as the situations and um, what we've seen with COVID. So people I think are starting to understand really how important it is to prevent antimicrobial resistance from becoming a pandemic. Um, and uh, we are getting more and more commitment from governments at this point in time to really support the whole market of antibiotic development. Um, it, it's fully stated that the market is broken and the companies, whichever they are, whether they are startups or, or big pharma, they can't really recoup. Um, effectively the investments they paid in so no one is crazy enough to pump one million or one billion dollars uh, and, and not really recoup that back to the, the zero at least the net zero um, so once people are aware of that no one will go into that field and, and that has started so um, the new developments to counter that negativity is the AMR Action Fund which was basically instigated uh, by Welcome. Uh, I was working on that project. So this is um, a late stage development fund, which focuses on capturing those new antibiotics that emerge from Carbex and Novo and Nordisk uh, fund, and really enable them to, to do late stage clinical um, uh, research. So phase one, two, and three. Um, and really push them into the market and commercialization. Um, that also um, showed by, by companies, pharma companies acting in such ways and they're coming together because it, it is an association of quite a few pharmaceuticals like Pfizer, GSK, Merck coming together to actually create something by themselves. That also shamed governments to action. And as you may have heard, we have various ideas around pull incentives. There's a lot of things that are happening in the US at the moment around the Pasteur Act, which would be, um, which is a full solution to the problem. Um, it acts a bit like a Netflix model in a sense that it would provide fixed payments to pharmaceutical companies to uh, compensate them for efforts of production of those antibiotics but um, the government would not pay for specific volumes of those antibiotics they would pay for the availability of having those antibiotics so what it means is pharma companies develop those antibiotics they are recompensated by the government and when the antibiotic is needed it's deployed so you also prevent overuse of antibiotics because in such model, the volume is delinked from payment. So companies, pharma companies don't have to sell huge quantities of antibiotics wherever they can, farming, um, human use, wherever they can put their fingers on. Uh, that, that can be stopped because the volume is delinked from sales. So this is a very good initiative. Um, we also have a few similar initiatives happening in Europe. Uh, I think there should be more of those. Uh, there is um, the UK pilot study um, happening at the moment. They've, the UK government selected three antibiotics that will go through initial trial. So a very similar subscription method um, where companies will be paid for uh, the efforts of producing that antibiotic and uh, it will be available to patients when needed. But again, it's, it's not uh, linked to sales. Um, a similar initiative also happened in the Benelux area in Europe and Sweden is also developing their own one, which I think is relatively advanced, but it's a semi-delinked method. So there is also an aspect of 
more profits coming to pharmaceutical companies, the more they sell. So it's a slightly mixed um, mix approach in, in this aspect. So in terms of developments, um, I think the pandemic helped a bit. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that it solved all the problems. Um, and slowly and steadily, the governments are realizing that AMI is a big problem and acting on it. I would obviously value more efforts here and more action. Um, but I think uh, at this point, it's all of us who have to uh, try hard. You are a group of young, um, talented people who can get into the field, become activists or researchers. It's an opportunity for all of us to, to make sure that the governments and the pharmaceutical companies hear us. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, John, for answering that question. Uh, we have another question from Medina Ondari asking, have there been any significant changes in the screening strategies for new antimicrobial compound stroke chemical entities, particularly in the context of multi-drug resistant pathogens? That's a good, that's a good question. So when I go to those platforms, if you screening platforms, if you, if you remember, it started with Mr. Uh, Waxman, who basically thanks to him, we have a majority, the majority of antibiotics currently available. It was very prolific. Um, and that was more of a phenotypic approach. So he looked into a soil sample and analyzed it and checked whether these bacteria are producing anything, et cetera, et cetera. And that has evolved. Um, but I guess the approach, the current approach is to, to do a mixture of things. Um, first of all, um, when you actually look into literature and, and, and kind of talk to people in the field, there are multiple approaches you can deploy to develop new antibiotics. First of all, you can look at existing antibiotics and improve them by changing the structure um, changing the functional groups. Um, and that's really important and that should be uh, done. We should continue doing this. This is a very effective way to improving our antibiotics um, and making sure that they are, we are on top of the resistance. This, but we also have to acknowledge that this has its limits, limitations are, are there. We also need, need new classes of antibiotics. And this is a very, uh, um, very important aspect of those as well. So at the moment, uh, the focus is more on holistic approaches. So the target-based approach was um, a reductionist method when you looked at the genetic fragments of those essential proteins and essential genes, and you and you try to find a compound that inhibits those or blocks those. And by doing that, uh, you hoped to find a novel class or a new antibiotic. We knew that this, now we know that this wasn't as effective as we thought it will be because um, the process is not as simple. That compound that potentially is inhibitory to a specific mechanism or a specific protein of interest still has to get through the cell, uh, the cell wall, the membrane. Uh, and on top of that, there are already existing resistance mechanisms such as efflux pumps that can just pump it out. So it's not as simple as just checking the targets versus the database. The current approach is to use functional methods, uh, cell screening. So you still look for, for cells and you test different compounds uh, on specific cells, bacterial cells. Also a, a new, relatively new lesson for us is uh, when we were screening um, different databases uh, using the target approach, genomics target approach. We really focused on the Lipinski rules of five. And as much as I want, wouldn't be able to quote all the rules, uh, the, the rules were slightly wrong. We were focusing on a specific set of properties for those molecules, such as that they are small, um, small molecules of low weight, et cetera, et cetera 
while uh, while now we know that antibiotics actually are not small molecules in, in many instances, they can be very long uh, molecules, and they are nowhere close to Lipinski rule of five. So in some ways, we were actually screening those libraries in a very ineffective way, and that is changing as well. We can also deploy trans transcriptomics, um, and uh, we have much better understanding of our current uh, genomics, uh, genomics technology. So those are still being used, but in a more informative way. Also, another approach that it, people advocate for is to look at existing drugs um, that have not been per se used as antimicrobials, or antibiotics, but they could be, be, they just haven't been screened um, against different cells. So you can still use existing databases of, of, of compounds that are not potentially anti, or we don't know whether they are antibacterial or not, and uh, find some new antibiotics or modify them uh, a little to make them more potent or turn them into antibiotics. Um, and uh, repurposing old drugs, so something that we haven't used for a while, um, but still we can change them significantly is, is important as well. There's a lot of also um, exploratory work around screening different various environments which we haven't really screened in the past. So some people are screening deep oceans, um, um, really focusing on specific uh, targets or just screening them against, as I said, using the phenotypic method against um, specific bacteria of interest to see if, if there's uh, if, if those if there's any antimicrobial properties happening. So I think at the moment it's a mixture of things. We've learned a lot from the past and we are de deploying different methods. Uh, an interesting one is, and I'm not sure if you've heard about it, is an initiative that was funded through Welcome. So I was part of Welcome for a while and I worked quite closely um, with COAD. So that's the initiative I mentioned. COAD is a, a public database that does free screening uh, for people, scientists, whoever is engaged in the development of, of new compounds. Um, so if you are a chemist, a biologist, and uh, but predominantly maybe for chemists really, if you um, constructed or developed a new compound or modified a compound which has never been used in, in any settings or maybe have been used as a specific drug but never tested for antimicrobial properties, such scientist, academic can submit that compound to COAD, um, so this initiative, and they will test it for antimicrobial properties and some initial toxicology uh, will be done as well. So this is a way of tapping into a wealth of chemistry databases that we haven't really screened thoroughly either. Um, and COAD is a database available online, so you can have a look as well. Uh, there's a wealth of, of compounds. Um, and the idea behind it is to really tap into the, the research that is currently being done by chemists. And uh, chemists don't really chemists are not microbiologists, so they wouldn't intrinsically think, oh, I've got this compound, I will develop an antibiotic. Uh, they might think, oh, I've got this compound, I'll just change it multiple times for fun. I'll, I'll maybe change it to see if it will be a cancer drug. Um, so this is also an approach to, to really do a wide range screening. And that initiative co op takes samples from scientists across the whole globe. So if you are engaged in any research related to uh, creating compounds, chemistry, you can also use their services. Um, and any patent rights are staying with the researcher. So if, if they do that testing for you and it happens that your compound has some antimicrobial properties, uh, it's all your property. Uh, you, you can still have a patent on it and it's yours. Um, and you can focus on developing that compound further and apply for funding from Carbex, which also funds um, companies and academics from any country, anywhere, um, and, and get onto the journey.
Uh, thank you so much, Joanne. Actually, uh, uh, you just given a, a very elaborate explanation on the same topic. Thank you so much and happy because of you. Thanks. Uh, the, uh, yeah, I can see another question up to there, but uh, yeah, 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 I see no question. Thank you so much up to there. Actually, as, uh, as students, as young researchers, uh, yeah, actually, we are learning a lot from you. There's a lot to are gaining, and I think uh, at the end of these sessions, we're going to eat a lot. Uh, as antimicrobial resistance, actually, it is a huge problem to the whole globe. And as young researchers, we do aspire to come up with solutions that could mitigate this problem. As students, I always believe that researchers can play a very critical role in coming up with new potential therapies, uh, new solutions to solve this problem. And as far as antimicrobial resistance is concerned, actually, we need a lot of awareness on the scene, a lot of awareness to get more information on how this antimicrobial resistance is occurring, uh, the mechanisms, and also getting more information on how to curb it, how to prevent, and how to mitigate it. That is the only way we can do it, only through research. That's why I can encourage my young, my fellow students, my colleagues, the young researchers, actually to get deep into the research, especially against the microbial resistance, because there's a lot of research we can do, but now this is the priority. This is our problem at hand. Actually, let's put all our efforts against the microbial resistance. Because even uh, as, as it can seem, but uh, the pipeline for new antibiotics, it's almost dry, it's almost dry. But now we cannot just stay behind that, uh, we cannot let it be that actually we must change the situation. We must improve our efforts the same. Uh, I think a lot of information, maybe because to come up with a solution, you need knowledge, you need the skills on the same. Because now to come up with a, uh, a very, uh, let's say maybe for example, uh, effective solutions, you must know how to approach the, the problem. If you don't know the problem, you wouldn't know how to approach it. Uh, uh, maybe for example, uh, when you say about uh, the mechanism of the develop, the developers, the develop already developed superbugs. Uh, actually, if we had the way of preventing before the occurred, actually, I can believe that uh, there could be a way that we should have prevented the occurrence of the superbugs. And still, I can believe that going further, there are a lot of um, uh, a lot of pandemics that are coming to uh, just because of antimicrobial resistance. And if we are not going to do anything, any effort to combat this, actually, we are going to face a lot of challenges as far as antimicrobial resistance is concerned. Uh, I think uh, because of uh, interest of time, I'm not going to talk much. Uh, uh, let me just invite Daniel uh, to offer some uh, photo thanks uh, as we end our session today. Yeah, over to you, Daniel. Thank you so much, Jimmy. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Jimmy is a uh, younger Joanna. She <laughs> is very interested in, in, in drug research and development. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, everyone, for attending today's session. It has been a pleasure, especially us who have been patient to the end of the session. It's almost, you're almost clocking two hours. And uh, thanks so much for the patience and, uh, you know, creating time to attend. And uh, special thanks and appreciation for you, Joanna, uh, for making time to attend this session and your immense willingness, you know, to engage us uh, despite your busy schedule, uh, we really appreciate, and we don't do not we do not take it for granted at all. Uh, and as we've been told, uh, you know, most of the uh, most of the researchers in antibiotic researchers either uh, retired or uh, you know shifted to other uh, lucrative uh, dr drug research and development programs. So we have this opportunity, and as you have heard. Uh, the situation is not as bad, so bad as it seems. Uh, there's a lot of increased funding coming along. Uh, we have, now that the problem is more visible, we have a lot of people who are willing to support us. So this is an opportunity that we can take up. Uh, we are still young, so we have a lot of time to learn more and you know, uh, choose this path. And so it's my hope that as you can see even in Africa, uh, we have really true drug research and development going on, and also in terms of vaccines and alternative therapies. I think you have all uh, kind of witnessed 
what happened uh, with uh, the, the, the vaccination rates. Uh, we have, uh, we don't have a lot of, you know, vaccination going on in Africa, uh, but it, it, it's a clarion call to us. Uh, we also need to, you know, act more and yeah, take part in the initiative. So thank you all, uh, it has been a great pleasure. And thank you, Joanna, I think she, so thank you. And I think with that, uh, we can uh, probably end the session there. So bye-bye everyone and thank you so much. So maybe uh, I was to offer Joanna, I think she has talked out, maybe it's her net. Uh, maybe Joanna, if you're wrong, you can offer some final remarks as we close off. 